Right, so I, I was tasked to, um, to think about how medical systems interact with this. And one of the things that's kind of quite striking to me is just quite how distant and much of what we're talking about is from medical systems. Um, and and I, I think the, one of the, the, the take-home messages that I'd like to give people is, to, is just to reflect a little bit on how biased your own perspective is about the role of medical systems in your research based on the medical system that you experience. And I think one of the you know, interesting thought experiments was if the, you know, the, the country that was driving a lot of the research agenda, putting a lot of investment, i.e. America, had the health system of Finland and vice versa, well, how would this conversation be different? So, so my personal biases, uh, as far as I can see them, my conscious biases, uh, so I work on neurodevelopmental disorders predominantly. Uh, that involves pediatric work. That involves interacting with uh, uh, clinical genetics as a specialty. Uh, it involves a genetic architecture, which has a large component of rare coding variation, although there is some polygenic um, contribution. So that frames uh, some of what my thinking. The healthcare system that I think about a lot is the NHS. Um, that has certain properties in terms of its scale. Uh, there's longitudinal ability to follow individuals. There's maturity of EHRs uh, or immaturity. Uh, the heterogeneity of it and the culture within it. And these are all kind of facets that one can think about their own, your own healthcare system in. Uh, and so it's worthwhile thinking uh, about that because I think there are some opportunities here that maybe we're not seeing um, because we have a large uh, group of people who are coming with different perspectives. Uh, and perhaps of everything that we're talking about, our healthcare systems are the most different between us. We share lots of the same ideas and lots of the same um, you know, yeah. desires to answer questions, but our healthcare systems are really heterogeneous. And, and in terms of translational focus, you know, the work that I do is focused very much on the diagnostic applications, also somewhat prognostic and improving management. And actually, the, the, the industry component is, is secondary to those. Uh, and, but I think in the common disease space, it's the other way around, which is not to say there's any greater value of one over the other. It's just that it, uh, the, the nature to which we come, the context by which we come to these discussions, will maybe be biased the amount of airtime we give to those different components. So what I've tried to do is try and think a little bit about what is a, a taxonomy, a partial taxonomy of where the medical systems fit within uh, our research. Uh, and, and this is kind of up here on the slide. And you know, some of these are kind of uh, obvious, but maybe, but maybe not so to, to others. So the, the first is that in, in my world, we're going through a transition where actually most of the data we want to do research on, most of the genetic data, is actually transitioning into the healthcare system itself. So, uh, so we're not going to be generating large cohorts and things that I work on in the research setting. They're going to be in the healthcare system straight away. And, so, and, and this will happen as genomic medicine kind of persists over time and more and more gets done in the healthcare setting. So these are, these are going to be issues that other people are going to face. But essentially, uh, under the kind of Genomics England model, researchers neither need to genotype nor phenotype individuals, but actually just access the data and, and research them. The kind of much more classic mode that me and my, my, my colleagues have worked in is, is directly working with the, the, the medical system uh, through its clinical services and using those clinical services both to identify patients, recruit patients, and phenotype them. Uh, and then we as researchers do the genotyping, so projects like the DD or PAGE projects that, that I work on. There are other approaches whereby you can use components of the medical system which aren't necessarily clinical services, but, for example, are, are registries, nationwide registries in the UK. So uh, this is a really lovely paper from Ellie Zaghini's group using the National Joint Registry. Um, uh, and you want recruitment and phenotyping can occur through those registries rather than clinical services. So they're somewhat more centralized. One doesn't have to necessarily go to 24 different centers or 40 different fetal medicine units as we do in those studies. Uh, and there's a, the, this is the National Congenital Anomaly and Rare Disease Registration Service, uh, which is you know, one such opportunity in the developmental disorder space, which is largely untapped. Then there's kind of indirect approaches, and this is where I think one of the, the key um, opportunities that is really untapped at the moment is to think about how does a, how does a medical system operate as a, uh, as a, a, a kind of 
recruitment opportunity for many different applications, many different uh, research types of researchers, whereby we mine routine clinical data to identify individuals of interest, and then we have systems of governance and, and recruitment that enable us to, to, to biosample those individuals and then research them. And the, and the longitudinal links into EHRs give us the ability to get clinical phenotypes. So there are, there are ongoing initiatives here. So the, this is the clinical practice research database, which is primary care, research one, <coughs> primary care in the UK. There are millions of people in these that one can identify and sample. It's tricky. Uh, it's not uh, a panacea. Uh, and the Health Data Research UK is a big initiative to try and open up these kinds of routine clinical data for different kinds of research applications. And then there's the much more minimal involvement, which is the more the director participant, which uh, there's a very nice study just started up called GLAD, um, run out of, uh, of London by Jerome Breen on depression, where they've recruited something like 20,000 individuals in six weeks uh, by focusing very much more on going direct to individuals. But the, so the linkage here is minimal to the medical system, but it's still important to get that link into EHRs. So this is like a partial taxonomy, I think, of different things. Now, now I suspect that you know, most of what we've, have been discussing about here in terms of disease consortia <coughs> is through this kind of route here. So only one of the strands of the many possible different strands that are the way that we can engage with medical systems. And I think there's various people experimenting with this kind of route here as well. Um, but there is a, there is a richer array here. And there are various opportunities down the line of thinking about mixed phenotyping models, some coming from healthcare systems, some coming from wearables, some coming from uh, other kinds of self-reported measures. So I think it's worth thinking about how we maximize this space. So the other thing that's kind of, what would it, it's, it's easier to think about an, what would an optimal engagement strategy look between researchers, uh, the CDC and healthcare systems, if we think what are some of the symptoms of the suboptimality? So I think there's several of them, which is, you know, when, when you start thinking about them, it's quite embarrassing for us as a community. So uh, the failure to implement, so pharmacogenetics, that, that science is, is very robust. It's not really implemented in our healthcare system in any meaningful way. Um, huge problems with even things like uh, cascade testing and familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, other healthcare systems have done better on this. Um, it'll be interesting to watch PRS in this space, um, how, how the, uh, the implementation of that will occur. If we think of the sample sizes that we, we typically have in our studies relative to the patient populations that we might have available to us, in a study like DDD, we probably recruited about half of the kids in the UK because we were working with all of the clinicians um, and pretty much all of them that were approached. In, in IBD, in, in the UK, where, where the UK, I think, has the largest single national collection of IBD, we're, we're touching about 3% of, of IBD patients. Uh, and if one takes into uh, you know, IBD with some you know, piece of therapy information, you're then down at far less than 1%. So we've nowhere near saturated the opportunity. So, and, and we, we're in this place here, which indicated you know, here where our sample size for our etiological studies is far, far less than our sample size in, in progression studies. Uh, and yet this is something that healthcare systems certainly care a lot about. If you think about what we do as researchers, there's a hell of a lot of things that would, uh, are also done in the healthcare system that are completely done in parallel with no real connectivity between them. So the healthcare system collects biosamples, it phenotypes patients, it generates genetic data, uh, even develops apps for patient engagement. So there's an NHS app that's coming out. Um, we, you know, as researchers, we collect biosamples, we phenotype patients, uh, we generate genetic data, and we think about developing apps. And often those are wholly unconnected. Um, but there are opportunities to connect them. The opportunities, for example, in the PAGE study, we use excess clinical samples for this. I think the, the, the same is done in, in, in the Vanderbilt system. Uh, there are good examples of good practice in, in many of these areas, but there's a much more opportunity for connecting up these than is currently done. Um, I think we have limited use of the research findings in clinical care. Uh, there are various different reasons for that. Um, there are more benefits that could come from that. We clearly, in a diagnostic setting, uh, you couldn't do a study without feeding back those, those diagnostic findings and finding routes to do it. It takes a lot of engineering, but it's a very positive thing to do. Um, and so uh, the, the other thing is that if you think about this from a healthcare system, you know, one of the things that's quite egregious to me is that the NHS spends almost a billion pounds on anti-TNF therapies, uh, and it knows it's incre they're incredibly... Uh, variable in their efficacy, and yet the biggest study that's been done is less than 1% of those patients. 
genetic study that's been done. So the healthcare system is not talking to the research community to say, this is a really important problem. Please help us to, to save, uh, help us to save hundreds of millions of pounds. That conversation hasn't clearly happened enough. Um, uh, otherwise, this wouldn't be uh, less than 1%. So there's some symptoms of suboptimality helps us uh, kind of frame a more optimal world. So the first is that there's rapid implementation of genomic medicine. The second is that where there's clinically indicated genetic testing and phenotyping, that those data are made available to researchers. And Genomics England, I think, is a really positive step in this regard. Certainly, if we compare it to the previous uh, uh, implementation of arrays in, in children with developmental disorders, essentially none of these data were made available to researchers. So it's a real uh, shift there. The use of excess clinical samples uh, as well as phenotypes, that's something I think we should explore. Uh, as we think about larger and larger cohorts, the cost of biosampling is, is going to go up, and DNA is a very easy thing to, to, to biosample. One of the, the key things, I think, with the opportunities we have uh, and other national healthcare systems have is thinking about ab initio recruitment of cohorts of particular interest to researchers in a way that is agnostic to can I get the clinical services really signed up to do this, that it allows you to do it um, through scalable mechanisms that might cut across different research questions. I think we can think more about how we uh, use research finds in clinical practice. I think this will depend very much on, on area to area, as we, you know, we got touched on in the, the previous discussion. Um, I think there is an interesting opportunity around here to think about the ecosystem of how we engage with participants in a more uh, kind of longitudinal way, the use of apps, and whether we end up with two completely different ecosystems, an ecosystem of research apps and an ecosystem of, of healthcare system apps, or there are opportunities to actually put those two together in ways that would be mutually beneficial. So, you know, one other kind of thing, you know, coming down... Uh, the pipe is thinking about the healthcare the system kind of in that kind of very minimal role is maybe the, the phenotypes coming from the healthcare system and maybe the genotypes coming from the patient. Uh, and they're actually engaging researchers. And I think as the cost of genome sequencing goes down, the perceptions of benefits to individuals goes up. Um, I think this will be an interesting model by which we, we, we ought to be thinking about scaling up in the future. So... This is a very parochial slide, and I slightly hesitate about showing it, but it gives some sense of how I think the various components in the, the UK might fit together, and I think there might be analogous frameworks in, uh, in other systems. So the first is we have the, these two large initiatives, one that's very clinically driven, this, the new genomic medicine service generating a data resource which can be used by academia and industry. We have the academic side, uh, most notably with, with UK Biobank, generating large amounts of uh, genotyping and sequencing data, those data being made available um, to the general community, but potentially also um, being uh, synergistic with these clinical data. Uh, and then the kind of letter, uh, you know, a thousand flowers bloom in terms of liberating the, the clinical data, having the means <laughs> by which uh, researchers of, of all stripes can identify relevant individuals within the healthcare system, recruit them into clinical trials or recruit them into research studies um, through scalable uh, generic governance systems uh, and uh, crucially expertise in understanding uh, exactly as, uh, as, as Rory was talking about, you know, who really has what disease? And that's where uh, engaging a large body of health data researchers is critically important. <coughs> so this, is, this kind of opportunity exists in many different healthcare systems, and I think it, it behooves all of us to try and think about how we can bring it to fruition. So uh, I'll, I'll leave you with, uh, with, with a slide, which is I recognise that by the nature of what I've been talking about, it's essentially quite parochial. Um, I've tried to generalize it in such ways, but uh, I think it's very difficult for the CDC to work out what should it do in this space, given the heterogeneity of each individual healthcare system. So I only have some question marks for you, uh, and uh, I'd be really interested, though maybe we don't have time for it today, uh, in this session now, is to think with many of you about, uh, about ways in which we can abstract out of our own complicated national systems some kind of path forward that might work in an international context. Okay, thanks. Time for a question, Robert. So this, uh, this concept of these virtual cohorts for clinical trials, I think, is something that's maybe underappreciated and is gaining a lot of kind of attention. Um, how do you think about 
that component of this system? Because I, I think that that's something that's incredibly powerful for these biobanks and, and how to incorporate the genetic component, the clinical data, the pharmacologic intervention. So I guess, have, have, you, have you thought through kind of real world virtual cohorts for clinical trials and, and, and the context of what you've described here? So, so I, uh, I know in, in Oxford, certainly people have been thinking about this a lot more than, than I have. I think there are sufficient commonalities amongst the people that have been thinking about uh, what has been 21st century clinical trials there's a lot of overlap with the kind of questions that we as researchers, basic researchers, may be really interested in. Uh, and, and what I'd like to work towards is a system that identifies those commonalities and has an infrastructure that supports both clinical trials, which might have other different requirements, not least from a governance perspective, and research studies. Because I think, I think ultimately from a healthcare system, it shouldn't, it, there shouldn't be much difference. Uh, perspective. So, so I think, uh, I fear is that we end up down a path that works you know, for clinical trials, but doesn't work for research and vice versa. So, so, so I, th I think talking to the guys in Oxford who have been thinking about this a bit more, I don't know if anyone in, in the audience wants to take that on, um, on the clinical trial side. One, one other question in the back. Sir, uh, Matt, what, what is the mechanism by which a new genetic test or gene panel can get rolled out here in the healthcare system? <laughs> is there a way that a, a result from UK Biobank uh, gets into the system and is reviewed by scientists? So, so the, the biobank and the genomic medicine services are two um, utterly distinct uh, entities uh, with, with, with different missions. And so there is no flow of, of biobank findings into the clinical record, as Rory, uh, as Rory mentioned. Um, there are other studies like, like DDD where we absolutely do that. And we, we, you know, we, we engineer pathways to enable the variants to be I validated. Discovery mm -hmm. generally, like an insight that emerges from <coughs> So yeah, so so I uh, so I think well in terms of diagnostic testing, there's a thing called the, the they're starting up there's the genetic test registry, which is tests that are blessed um, uh, in, in the UK. That's a very new thing. Uh, it's not a comprehensive thing. In terms of how these things get taken up, it's incredibly heterogeneous. It, you know, it, you might imagine with a national healthcare system like the, the the failure to take up cascade testing in FH, for example, or FH screening. You know, it involves a whole different other set of people and decision makers than the people uh, you know thinking about uh, polygenic scores in breast cancer and improving screening, which is a completely different set of people who thinks about the pharmacogenetic <coughs> implementation or lack thereof. You know, it's not joined up currently uh, at all. Um, I, I, I agree with the fact that it's messy and heterogeneous, but the shift of Genomics England having a genetic test registry and the reorganization of this National Genomic Service for Rare Disease is trying to produce a better part of a class of patients that will always get, well, should always get uh, a genomic assay on it. And then I think the question there is, there's a bunch of of sort of virtual panels, so the genes which you look at where, where a report is generated. And there's a process inside sort of Genomics England to try to keep those up to date. Again, it's a bit clunky and messy at the moment, but at least there's a process of some description to try and keep that process you know, close to what the research findings is. This is in the rare disease space, not in the mm -hmm. other uses of genomic medicine. Yeah, so I, I guess I, I would just add to that. If one thinks about the different genomic medicine applications which touch on different types of patients, different clinical specialty, specialties, the one thing they ha all have at their core is the requirement for robust informatics. Uh, and I think having Genomics England there with, with that particular mission means that potentially one can layer on top new applications <coughs> into a common informatics framework. That's, the, that's I think, the opportunity that, that Ewan is talking about, which we've never had before. Uh, and, and the potential is without that, you end up solving your problems for one particular application, and that has no feed forward into the next application. 